Good day and welcome. Our guest today was born in Hong Kong, moved to Canada in the early 1970s, a professional career in stock and commodity futures broker, starting his successful acting career at the age of 30, getting his feet wet with a local community cable television station, where he created a financial segment in the Chinese language. Success of that show took him to hosting, interviewing, training and acting in drama, along with producing documentaries. Moving to Toronto in the late 1980s, where he landed a breakout role in the feature film, Guilty as Sin. After his success, he was casted in Where the Truth Lies. In 2017, he left his trade and found success with Netflix original murder mystery starring across Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. You may recognize him from The Handmaid's Tale, from My Fake Boyfriend, Murder Mystery, Virtual Hitman, Total Recall, Murdoch Mysteries, The Rocker, The Sopranos, John Q, National Lampoon Senior Trip, or Counter-Strike. Please welcome Simon Sim. Simon, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Oh, you're very welcome, Chris. And oh, yeah, by the way, I have to compliment you for doing such good uh, homework. <laughs> Some of the things I have totally forgotten. And hello, viewers. How are you? <laughs> well, you can't forget, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, Simon, I want to dive into it with you. You spent two years working at a community cable station hosting your own finance show. What compelled you to do that? Well, uh, it, 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 it was in Calgary. Uh, I just came back to Canada, you know, after spending a few years doing the uh, uh, investment business overseas, you know, in Jakarta, which is the capital of Indonesia and Doha, Qatar, you know, where, where they held the uh, World Soccer last December. I was in Calgary. I was working for a brokerage firm, you know, as a stock and commodity futures broker. And, you know, in this kind of business, you have to make a lot of cold calls. You know, you have to get clients to uh, gain revenue. And I felt that just by making cold calls, it wasn't enough. I got to throw myself out and let people notice me, you know, so that, you know, to prove that, hey, I know what I'm doing, come work with me. So at that time in Calgary, there was a community cable TV channel. And once a week, you know, on a Friday evening between eight and nine, which is prime time, they have their one hour for the Chinese community. At that time, there was, uh, during the one hour, they were doing uh, the news, uh, interviewing, and then the last half hour, they show a soap opera from Hong Kong. So I thought, hey, you know, because I knew a lot of Chinese were watching, you know, that program. So I thought maybe I should get on and so the people will hopefully they'll know me better. So I, I approached them and said, hey, you know, uh, during your news program, why don't I give me two minutes or whatever time so that I can uh, tell them a little bit about the uh, financial world, how the stock market did during the week, the gold prices, the oil prices, and they like the idea. So they asked me, okay, write something, come to the set, and then uh, let me take a look. So I did it. And as soon as, oh, what surprised me was I wasn't nervous at all. As soon as I sat down and I read, I mean, also maybe it helped because it was, it, because I wrote it myself, it was my, my style. So I read it and delighted. They, they said, okay, let's do it. And then the director pulled me, pulled me aside and said, hey, Simon, you know, we, we like your stuff. And why don't you get more involved with our, you know, live, live one hour show, you know, maybe hold, uh, you know, hold uh, from time to time. And I said, oh, okay, I'll give it a try. And then after that, then I do it once every couple of weeks. And then it expanded a little bit to uh, <laughs> producing and acting in a, in a little bit of drama. That's how I learned uh, acting because I was able to work with a few veteran actors, you know, who were Chinese trained in China, you know, theater actors. So it really helped a lot. That's how I sort of uh, learned a little bit about acting. And before that, I knew absolutely nothing about acting. <laughs> so Calgary pretty well sort of, uh, you know, opened the door for me, opened, opened my eyes. And I, that's how I learned about, oh, okay, there's something uh, like this going on. And it seems that uh, I am pretty good at it too. 
because when I was on the show, I was very natural. Of course, you know, we we made rookie mistakes. Say sometimes, you know, when the director said three, two, one, go, and then we just did look at him stone and said me, <laughs> and then we just jumped in. So <laughs> but we made a lot of rookie mistakes, but it was fun. I really enjoyed those couple of years. Now you were a volunteer. You volunteered your time at the station. Is that right? Oh yeah, no pay. You know, just all the, We were all volunteers. Yeah, we all we all had, uh, we had our our real jobs. Now, did you find that working with the community station, volunteering there, helped helped your business? Oh yeah, it did. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Because I did, I did get some clients. You know, they approached me because at the end of the show, I said, you know, uh, this is in, in in Cantonese. You know, I'm Simon Sin from you know this company. And then they, I mean, of course, I wouldn't give them the telephone the telephone number. It would be too obvious, right? And they did, you know, uh, call me. But at that time, there was no email, right? You know, it, it was like early 1980s. So they just simply call me. So yeah, you know, yeah, it did help, and it actually. It sort of made my life a, a, a bit more interesting too, but I had to rush a bit eh? because, like, uh, every Friday, you know, when I when when I would go on, you know, Friday evening, as soon as the market closed, like three thirty, four o'clock, I started writing the script, you know, myself, you know, in uh, Chinese, and then uh, went home, you know, have grab a quick bite, and then drove straight to the studio. And imagine, you know, winter in Calgary. Sometimes it was snowing hard, right? And I, I was driving there as seven o'clock in the evening and then we had about an hour to rush to get together and then uh, there was a co-host you know a lady or something that we sort of uh, planned a little bit and everything just uh, you know on you know just no, not not much preparation that's why we made mistakes but that was part of the fun mm-hmm. Well, that tends to happen when you don't have the time to, to review things, especially on that timeline, right? You only have an hour or two to get it na- uh, nailed down before you jump on. And we were all amateurs, right? <laughs> yeah. I, we still are, right? I mean, you see the, uh, oh. the most professional people out there who still have a blooper reel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, they were good. They, were, they, they are very good compared to what we did. <laughs> but like so, I said, that's part of the fun. Well, no, of course. Yeah, it's, it's that improv ribbing and, hey, maybe I misenunciated something and now you have to figure a way through it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Chris, before we go on, because of my uh, natural Chinese accent, so if uh, there's anything you don't understand, that means if you don't understand, the viewers don't understand too, right? So you better jump in so that I can say it again. 100%, yeah. Okay. So, Simon, how do you believe your experience working at the community station has impacted your success as an actor? Uh, it's the experience. Yeah, and also it gave me confidence eh, when I realized that hey, you know, I'm not ner- I, I'm not nervous at all. In fact, you know, I am very comfortable with it. So it's sort of yeah, I think confidence is the is the main thing. And then uh, so after I moved to Toronto, then I realized the uh, potential of Hollywood North, right? They call it. <laughs> then I, and and also, you know, I had a very smooth start in the beginning. You know, I hooked up with a talent agent and then she immediately got me uh, uh, auditions. But of course, you know, like like I said, I had no experience whatsoever with, you know, in that area. Although, I, I mean, appearing in community TV channel and doing the real acting are totally different things. In fact, in the beginning, I made some really, really bad mistakes. Eh? And there was one show, it was so bad that, you know, when I finished, I thought, oh, I think that's it. I don't think people will hire me anymore, you know, because words would spread. But surprisingly, they didn't seem to mind. In fact, you know, when 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 my wife watched the show afterwards, she said, hey, this is one of, I mean, you, even years later, she said, hey, this is one of your best work. And I can't believe it because shooting it was so painful because I had I had absolutely no idea what I was doing at that time, you know, on the set. And I'm glad I survived. But definitely the community channel sort of uh, opened my eyes, made me real, gave me confidence. And then um, I took it from there. Now, when you talk about that performance just now, are, are you able to share with us a little bit more? Do you remember what your role was? Do you remember the, the production what it was? Where can we find that clip? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's okay because they, they shot it so many times that uh, they, they, they were able to pick out the so-called good stuff. Where the show is called uh, Counter-Strike. Uh, it was like 1980s. Actually, do you know who was in it? Uh, Christopher Plummer. 
Oh, but he he only appear once every few ep episodes. They, but every show, you know, they just use his, his audio. And then there's an English actor called Simon McCockendale. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Oh. And then another actress from uh, uh, France. Yeah, because in the 80s, they, Toronto was so busy. There were so many TV episodes going on because there was no reality TV, right? So it, it was all scripted shows. So the Counter Strike, that was my all, more or less my very first uh, TV, uh, you know, TV episode, and I prepared myself very well, of course. So in the morning, you know, we had the master shot, you know, show in the, in the restaurant, showing you know me and the other actors, you know, all of us, in, you know, all all together, and then after that, they had the close up of each actor. Of course, they started, you know, with the, uh, the the most famous actor first. So I said, okay, fine. So I did everything right. I spoke my lines. I was perfect. And then we had lunch, right? After after lunch, I, I was so relaxed. I said, oh, okay, I, I, I love those shrimps. And then all of a sudden they said, okay, Simon, we're doing your close-up now. I said, what, what, what does it mean? What's close-up? I said, no, oh, it, it will be on you now. But because I was so relaxed, I totally forgot every word. So when I went on, oh, we had so, I mean, we, they were quite, you know, we, there were so many cuts. And in fact, there was one scene, you know, I, I, I totally, no word coming out. So I just made up something. The scene was with uh, Simon McCockendale. He just looked at me funny and said, what the, <laughs> where, the, where did this line come from? But eventually, you know, I was, you know, I settled down a little bit, but I think, yeah. That's why I thought, oh my God, that's it. I, I think the crew loved that, right? Because I gave everyone overtime. Right. But then it was, <laughs> I really felt awkward. And I thought, okay, that's it. My career was over. And then, but then, and then oh, the same casting director contacted me again next time and said, okay, Simon, we want to audition you for this role, et cetera. But it seems that nothing, it seemed that nothing had happened. But so I said, <laughs> so I learned a lot of things the hard way. That we often do, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. So walk me through this transition. You you transitioned from a professional training career and you started pursuing acting full time. How did how did that work for you? When did you decide in outside of 2017? When did you decide, hey, this is now the, the time to step forward and just go after it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, during that time when I was doing two jobs, uh, it, it was very challenging. And thank God, you know, those auditions don't come all the time because when I, 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 I was very frank with my agent, I said, hey, I, I have a real job here, nine to five, because I have a mortgage, I have a family, I had a son, so I can't really quit my job. So be choosy with these uh, roles. Only give me ones that you think is really suitable for me. Don't send me to some, 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 some auditions that don't really have a very good chance. So it worked out really well. <coughs> but still, it was very challenging in a way very difficult because when it comes to audition they normally let you know the day before so say three o'clock four o'clock in the afternoon I got a call from my agent or she sent me a fax or email me and say okay Simon I have an audition for you tomorrow at 11 o'clock in this office this is the address and I'm sending you the size you know the size like a few pages of the script so I very had I, I had very little time to prepare because you know I was in the office I, I I didn't get to prepare until I got home after dinner and only had a few hours right because at the same time the TV was a distraction <laughs> and then I was mentally tired I was supposed to relax right you know after trading all day but then I had to memorize memorize the line so I, I find it very very difficult and then the following day I was I say I went into the office to the trading my my head you know I was trading currencies at that time you know my head was full of pound sterling dodge marks Swiss francs Canadian dollars all of a sudden you know, I look at the watch 10 o'clock and then I have to really wind down, focus on the line, you know, okay, what, what I'm going to say, my script, my lines. And then, so it's very difficult, you know, my mind could never settle down. So when I went to the audition, especially you went inside the audition room, you know, standing in front of a few strangers, right? The casting director, producer, director, God, they're talking about pressure. And then, oh, plus the fact I wasn't 100% prepared, right? Because my mind was still full of pound sterling, right? So now I'm trying to get those out, you know, out of my head and focus on the line. So there were some auditions I did very well, which surprised me. And then some I thought, okay, that's it. I've really screwed up. 
<laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, so they were good auditions, bad auditions, but uh, but you know, that was the price I had to make when I, I had to make when you are juggling two jobs. So eventually come 2017, it was also time to retire. I thought, okay, I, I worked long enough now. I just want to chill and relax and really retire. And then I thought, hey, you know, I can still continue to uh, pursue the uh, my acting career. Yeah. So I told my agent, okay, you know, I, I'm more available now. And then, you know, I was very fortunate shortly after in a few months, to, I mean, in a few, shortly after, almost immediately after I did the... Uh, a show, a Canadian show called May Day. And mm -hmm. the show, I mean, I I had quite a big role, you know, which took about four or five days to shoot. And if I had uh, if I had my real job, I wouldn't be able to take four or five days off just like that. So I retired the right time. And then came the show Murder Mystery, the Netflix movie. Uh, again, I had to spend three weeks in Montreal to shoot all the interior scenes. And then being the captain of a yacht, they sent me to Italy for a week. You know, just for a couple of scenes. Imagine if I was doing my nine to five job, no way I could tell my employee, hey, I gotta I gotta take four or five weeks off just like that, right? You know, who would be doing, who would be looking after my client? So I think I retired at the right time. And uh like last summer I did another web series with um, I mean on and off, you know, some took several weeks to complete. So you know, I wouldn't be able to do it if I was not retired. No, of course. Now, I want to ask you something a little bit closer to home for you. Is there anything, are there any specific cultural influences or experiences that have played a significant role for you in your work? Uh, yeah, I think being Chinese, I, th I think I sort of a start, I, I, th I was able to start at the right time because I started early 1980s. At that time, there weren't too many uh, Asian actors in uh, Canada. And there was a and there was a slowly a demand, you know, uh, for Asian actors, you know, Chinese, you know, like the show uh, in Toronto, called, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, uh, Kung Fu: The Legend Continues. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, every episode they need a lot of Chinese, you know, background actors. Well, I I hardly do any background, but then they need a lot of Chinese, yeah. And also, before I returned to Calgary, like I told you earlier, I was uh, working overseas, you know, in uh, I'm, uh, I, I worked in Hong Kong, Jakarta, and also Doha, Qatar. And those uh, overseas exper experience really opened my eyes, you know, not just for acting my life too. Because um, until I went to those places, I knew absolutely nothing about the culture, you know, of those places, you know, uh, the religion, you know, like mm -hmm. Islam and Middle East, you know, before I, I went to Doha, I just thought, okay, Middle East is uh, Middle East, you know, and then when I found out I was going to Doha, I said, you know, where is Doha? Then I found out it is on Persian Gulf and oil, a little oil country. But I think being overseas, sort of uh, communicating and interacting with, uh, you know, foreign nationals, all these things really enrich my life, you know, which I can apply, you know, to my mm. acting and also my everyday life, you know, as a person, you know, I'm very inclusive. I, I just love simple things and I appreciate simple things after spending all those, you know, good and tough years overseas. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. I, I would like to ask you something with your, with your heritage. Have, did you find a lot of challenges being a non-native English speaker pursuing you know, acting in an English dominated industry. Yeah. But yeah, to, but there, there is, you know, f well, first of all, your roles are more or less restricted until recently, you know, after this, uh, the Black Lives Matter, which started a few years ago. Before that, it wasn't that inclusive, right? You know, I saw my roles were limited to, you know, uh, many Asian uh, roles, you know, like a, a, a triac. Uh, the boss of a triad gang, you know, a restaurant owner, a crooked lawyer, you know, or you know, a, a storekeeper, things like that. So, I mean, in a way, it helps, but it also limits myself. But mm -hmm. after I gained more experience, you know, a, a couple of you know, a ten years later, people started to, uh, you know, appreciate, recognize my skill. Then the role, you know, more roles start to come, you know, because in fact, there are a lot of roles that, that they could cast, you know, any, you know, nationality. You know, before that, like 20 years ago, it was mostly Caucasian. You know, everyone just wanted to play safe. No one thought of, ah, maybe a, an East Indian can be a, 
the principal of a school or something like that, right? You know, so it helps. But also in my case, because after all, English is my second language, although I've been living in Canada for, you know, so many years. So when I study, you know, for the, uh, you know, for the audition, it's sort of a kind of uh, very, a little bit challenging too, because on top of trying to analyze the roles, trying to do well for, to prepare myself. Now I, I have to channel some of my energy, you know, to memorizing the lines, which is not my first language. Mm -hmm. and then, so it, it is also difficult because I also know that sometimes there are a lot of these words that you don't use very often in your everyday life. All of a sudden you have to use it. And I know that a lot of writers, they don't want you to change the words. You know, they want you, although in the audition, I normally pay, not, don't pay much attention to words because I know they basically just look at you. They want to see you, how you act and react, you know, a, a few words here and there, they don't really care, but still you want to stick to it as closely as possible. So sometimes I have to, like I said, as a result, because I have to channel part of my energy to the uh, to the words, to the dialogue, so it makes it you know, a, little, a little bit challenging, and uh, and I and also found out the thing is you know there are a couple of uh, auditions and uh, I speak Cantonese. And I found out, oh my God, it was such a piece of cake. You know, I was able to memorize two pages of dialogues in, you know, 10 minutes. And then I also did better because at that time, everything thing, thing came, came so natural. So there are advantages and disadvantages. Well, I appreciate that. Now, I would like to ask you, can you share an example of a particular memorable or challenging performance that you've had to do? Hmm. Well, let's see. I do remember my very first. It, it wasn't really challenging, or but it was memorable. My very first uh, uh, feature film, you know, not a TV show, a film, and it was directed by uh, Sidney Lumet. I mean, he was the one who. I mean, he's deceased. He's the one who directed uh, what Twelve Angry Men, uh, Dark Day Afternoon, uh, Orient Express, and. I, 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 yeah, when I auditioned, I didn't even know who, uh, you know, when they sent me the uh, breakdown of the audition, I didn't even know who he was until my wife said, oh my God, that's Sidney Lumet. <laughs> so I auditioned and I didn't give much thought about it. And then I found out, you know, days later, my agent said, well, Simon, you got the role. And it was a pretty big role too. And then uh, I was surprised. But he, she said, well, uh, Sidney Lumet is actually in Toronto right now. Be but before he hired you, he wanted to interview you. And so, oh my God. God. So I went to Sutton Place Hotel, you know, some people still remember Sutton Place. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful hotel in uh, what Bay and Blue. Unfortunately, it's uh, not there anymore. So I went up there, there was him and the uh, casting director, the two of them, and I was nervous. At the end, I said, well, I'm sorry, I was a bit nervous, even, you know, uh, while we were chatting. He said, no, he said, actually, we, we like to see you sort of nervous because in your scene, there, there were a few courtroom scenes. You were supposed to be nervous. I said, oh, so it turned out really well. And I'm, I'm proud that I was, you know, that I had the opportunity to work with uh, Miss, Mr. Lumet. And I also work with some, you know, really good directors like uh, Atom Egoyan, you know, from Toronto. Mm -hmm. And my very last show, you know, uh, Streams Flow from a River, you know, uh, last last summer, I worked with a very young Chinese uh, director, Christopher Yip. You know, it was a it was a web series uh, shot in Hamilton, Dundas, you know, out, out, out there in Ontario. After that, I didn't, you know, you know, give it much thought about it because I thought, oh well, you know, we were lucky. We were lucky if a CBC would pick it up and show it on a Saturday or Sunday night. <laughs> no one is watching. And then, um, and then this March, we found out. Oh my God! You know, first of all, uh, we appeared in. We made our launch in uh, Canadian Film Festival late March, and the Vancouver Asian Film Festival, and then all of a sudden. We found out that uh, Cannes in France yep. picked us up, and then uh, so we made our international debut there. It was uh, it was called Cannes series, not this Cannes which which, which mm. had a lot of uh, famous stars like a fashion show, right? Ours was uh, held in April. It's called Cannes series. It is for independent filmmakers, for TV shows, uh, documentaries. So there were about 20 of us, 18, 16, 18 of us all went to Cannes. I had a lovely time there. It was really 
once in a lifetime experience. And who would have thunk, you know, a, a small project, a web series shot in Hamilton turned out to be in Ken. In fact, right now in, in June, they are also showing it in uh, uh, somewhere in Spain, Valencia in Spain. Oh. Yeah, it was uh, yeah, I mean, something I totally unexpected. And I was really fortunate, you know, to be involved in that show. That's amazing. And, you know, yeah. certainly is very memorable as you're, you're able yeah. to recall it. And, just and also in Ken, I had, it. also in Ken, I love seafood, right? So in Ken, I had the best grilled octopus. Oh, God, you die for. <laughs> something you cannot find. Well, hopefully I can find one in Toronto. So if anyone knows there's a, Good restaurant in Toronto, you know, with a uh, grilled octopus. Let Chris know, and then Chris will let me know. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> Price is not an object, you know, just <laughs> grilled octopus. Tender. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you something a little bit more personal. And, and is there something that people tend to misunderstand about you the most? Uh, I, I think I'm a man of uh, principle. Yeah, sometimes I pursue something just out of principle, you know, even though it is only $5, $15, but just because I just feel that, hey, this is not right, you know, I got to, you know, get it right. So I would keep pursuing it. It might cost me more to recoup the five, five, ten bucks. But I, yeah, I think it's a principle thing. People sometimes may think, oh, Simon, you're cheap, or sometimes, come on, you, you make a, something out of nothing. But, it, but sometimes the principle. So as a result, I often... I mean, because I'm retired now, I have quite a lot of, of time in my hands. So I would, uh, every day I would, uh, you know, read, say, Toronto Star Online and Sportsnet, and I would write comments. Oh my God, sometimes I was so, I wouldn't say vicious, but sometimes I was so opinionated and uh, people were just saying, oh my God, he's a grumpy old man or something. But hey, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm very easygoing, you know, so just, just want to let everyone know I'm not a grumpy old man. That's awesome. <laughs> now, is there something that you believe that, that we as a society should start doing or stop doing as of tomorrow? Like if you had that magic wand, boom, what would it be? Uh, I think the, uh, I'm glad that, you know, since the uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, a lot of things have changed, you know, where people are getting more and more inclusive and which is a good thing. Also, I'm glad I, I, I am living in Canada. I had a, I mean, a few years, I mean, many years ago, I, I had I had a choice of either to live in Canada or live in the States. And I picked Canada and I'm glad I picked Canada, although it is cold. And uh, I mean, compared to what we are right now, I mean, it's not perfect, it's, you know, but it's not bad, especially. Nice. That's nice out. Especially compared to the U.S., you know, all these political infighting. I remember years ago in the States, eh, the parties have differences you know, uh, different policies, they, you know, they argue and everything, but nothing really personal. Now it's almost like everyone is, you know, trying to kill each other. Yeah. So it is really sad. And of course, I hope to see the uh, Ukraine war come to a close soon. You know, this is very, very unfortunate. And I can't believe it went on for over a year. And in fact, when it happened, I was surprised that because I never thought that Russia would actually do it. Yeah. But I don't want to get into no, political no, no. stuff. Yeah. But otherwise I just I just want everyone to get along. And of course, of course it's not it's not that easy, you know, with all the things going on and we are all different, right? But just try to be tolerant, inclusive, you know, because uh, there are always way, you know, there are always ways to make things better. Well, it's well said. I appreciate that. I have time for one more question for you, Simon, and it's what makes Simon Sin smile? <laughs> What makes Simon Sin smile? Well, a few people actually told me that Simon, if you don't smile, you look, you look kind of sad. And I said, oh my God. So I always try to remember this. So I always try to sort of, uh, you know, at least move my lips up a little bit, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, but I don't, like I said, you know, I'm very easygoing. A lot of things can, I mean, I'm basically a very happy person. I'm quite content. So little things can make me appreciate and, smile and especially if you put a plate of grilled seafood in front of me i will smile chris <laughs> that's amazing i'll remember that one that's all the time i have for you today simon Sin. you've been absolutely amazing 
Uh, everybody, remember to have a fantastic day and smile to inspire. Thank you for watching Coffee with Chris. Our guest today, Simon Sin. Goodbye, everyone.